are classified. Okay, what do we get after this? This is one type of coding as well. So one of the different types of coding that is uh, you can share with your within your uh, work group mm, can be just as simple as this. Just the idea that <coughs> a model will have different statuses or a file will have different statuses is a coding mechanism in itself. So for instance, uh, the thing that you attach to a a drawing where you say, well, this is for comment, for information, for coordination, for tender, for approval, and for construction, is both a trigger for a particular workflow scenario, so a workflow automation could result in you uh, having the file automatically visible to somebody else or not, if it has reached the for information or for common status and maybe it will be hidden if it is for review because it's, it's not visible already to the other parties or any other way of, of classifying this. Uh, now, what this constitutes is in itself a library. Okay, Agreeing on some values for the codes and the meaning associated for that is in itself as a little library. And for very simple libraries such as this one, it's very simple to distribute a, a, a word file to every participant party, and it's an easy thing to agree. Uh, what happens when you have more, more, more complicated libraries? We are likely going to see when uh, later tonight Steve Hamill will be here, and we will be talking about the National BIM Library. Uh, of the MBS. Uh, so this slide gives us more information on how you uh, can manage uh, activities on files and, and processes by attaching uh, versioning information and also discover that libraries are also into coding systems and in anything, any classification that you will adopt. Another important aspect of uh, that is much much more complicated or potentially much more complicated when it comes to uh, building information models than it could be in other for in other forms of collaboration or collab communication or coordination is the fact that uh, if we push the limits of what is the ability of people to edit edit information um, and if you have shared repositories for people it might be that every at every moment in time somebody might be doing some modification one might be updating a few bits uh, updating a few walls update, updating a few windows and so on so the model of the building will continuously change. Otherwise, you will not be working. That's your job as a designer at some point to make all the editing to the door. Now, traditionally, this was solved by just keeping things still for a long time and issuing new drawings every, uh, every given interval in time. If you're working in a shared environment, um, and particularly if you're working in a building information modeling application, whenever you move a single element inside the whole model, a lot of different drawings will be impacted by that. So if you change a wall uh, in a section in, 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 in a, in on, on layer one, you, it might be that uh, the plan will change, the elevation will change, another section will change, so everything in the model will be coordinated and all the possible representation of that will be updated. So it becomes much more complicated to know what must happen once these changes are triggered. Now, in uh, computer science, uh, uh, in computing science, in software development, uh, this has been a problem for a long time because people have been using 
uh, have been collaborating on software development for much longer than they have on uh, on generic uh, on, on construction, uh, really. so on building information models. So traditionally, what would be a mechanism to do that is to uh, get some bit of information, and this is the shopping list that we are designing at this moment, get some bit of information, check it out, which means take it out of the shared repository with everybody else and put a lock on it. So you say, well, right now I am editing this file and right now I am, uh, so I, I must prevent somebody else to make contemporary changes because if they did, there would be a clash with the changes that I am putting in. So I, I get this milk, eggs and juice and change it to milk, eggs and soup but this might not be a, an instantaneous change. I might take some time to think about it. I will have the file open for some time, make a number of changes, and then I will be working on a working copy. At some point, though, uh, the system will be able to recognize that there is some sort of... Uh, that I'm happy with the changes that I've made. So after having checked it out, I put it back into the main trunk, in the main process of the information and release it for other people to read again. The problem we are having with this in the environment of a building information model is that whereas files in traditional software development mechanisms are very partial components of the whole project, in building information model, modeling they tend to be massive. I'll try to rephrase this. So a software application is generally composed of, fr from a software development point of view, is generally composed of maybe hundreds of files and what happens here is that you just lock one of them, which is the one that you're working on temporarily, so a lot of other people can go on working without noticing any um, problem on all the rest of the environment. So you locked something, but your lock was only a very small partial lock. So many people could have gone on working on, on their business. Uh, in building information modeling, that is generally a problem because if you open the big Revit file that contains plans, elevations, and, and uh, schedules, and first, second, third, fourth floor, and, and all of it, if you did use the same approach, you would prevent anybody else from doing any changes to the building. Okay? So this is not an easily workable solution. So there are a number of problems that could happen if you try to prevent this locking mechanism. So you want to make changes to whatever you need to change without stopping somebody else from working on it. Okay. The way in which this happens must rely <coughs> on a centralized server. So if you're not contemporarily connected to an, a, a unique source of information with the other people you're working with, there is no way for you to distribute the information that at this very moment you want to lock a single bit of information, a single portion of the, of the design. So one solution could be that we work in decentralized environments, everybody do their change, and then at some point you try to see if there are easy and clear ways in which you can merge back the changes that several people did independently. <coughs> so I was working on this project, you were working on this project, we had two copies of the file, um, I made. I went in and added a wall. You went in and added a window in a completely different wall. The system could theoretically recognize that the rest of the building is completely identical, so it will generate a new version of the draw the design where uh, there is one wall added and a new window to one of the other walls that were already there, and this will result in a successful merging operation where you get 
make uh, uh, s some changes and uh, and multiple changes by different people can successfully coexist. So I add the bread, somebody else add the m the rice. All together, the rest will be we need to be do, to buy milk, add soup, bread, and rice. That's an easy and feasible thing. But if I I can think of conflicts where I go in and change this table to be a square table, you go in and change this table to be an oval table, and the system will not be able to tell what shape the table will eventually be, because there are conflicting changes that we both put in. Uh, so, the some of the applications that you will see on the market are somehow capable of dealing with this level of locking some others won't so in your BIM execution plans you will want to investigate if the workflow that you envision is compatible with uh, contemporary editing processes we have seen yesterday how very frequently this is avoided by splitting the models into multiple files where different specialist contract specialist designers will have full access to all the authoritative information in one file and the building that you see will be the result of the merging of those several files. Are, are you getting all of the terminology that I'm using here? Now, theoretically though, this is only a technical workaround for this problem that I just covered. Okay, it's important to understand that this is a common practice currently in the business, but there is no technological or better, there is no theoretical uh, limitation in having a system that will not require any of that, but will instead allow you to work in real time and contemporarily on all the models from multiple users and try and sync back through the merging mechanism all the changes that everybody put in independently. That would be insane. The, the te that would be a hell of a lot of stress on the hardware. Ah, well, hardware is not an issue, I think, in most scenarios. It depends on which way locale, which locale you're from, though, isn't it? Cause it I think it's, it's likely to be, there is likely to be some level of bottleneck in yeah. terms of... Uh, Real-time modeling. ...of um, network bandwidth. So, the sometimes the the amount of data that you'll have to transfer across the network will be massive. Yeah. But in terms of local computation, I don't think that would be a major problem. The major problem at the moment is that uh, this is not a common behavior for professionals. They don't just go in and change anything anytime they want and also they want to kind of feel that they retain the ownership of a file there is this concept of this file is my file I am the author of it I am responsible for its contents and so on oh, sure enough but the, the function that you know the process that you're talking about is the work sh works that sharing it as experience within Revit for instance I mean, different, a, different application will allow you different uh, mechanisms for in, for uh, merging them back. But yes, Revit can do this. But yeah. working on a center model and consist consistently saving back, that's not real time modeling, is it? Uh, is that the concept? Because uh, the impression I got is that you can actually work on the file and it is constantly updating, as in every two seconds. So it's, it's uh, constantly broadcasting the changes to all our to all other users that have that information set open at the moment 
that is what I would probably call real time mm -hmm. modeling. Not um, borrowed elements or anything like that. Borrowed? No, you know, it's not the work sets and borrowed elements that take place. Um, I don't look at the. Uh, uh, you've got a centralized model. Okay. You've got two. You know, you've got three logo copies. Okay. Say if I'm working on the wall, uh, if I want to put up a window and not at that wall, uh, but I've got a log there. But if I say back to central. Yeah, takes, yeah, well, if it's not concurrent, there is no problem, okay? Mm -hmm. If you do move it first and then you save it back and then she downloads it and puts a window in, that, that's not an issue. But that's not the concept. The only problem is all when these activities happen concurrently. So they happen between, uh, you know, in the same time interval between two synchronization moments with the central server, okay? So let's say you have a local copy of a file and Ivana has another one mm -hmm. okay if you download the copy from the server yeah. do something put it back she downloads the new version mm -hmm. does something puts it back no problem whatsoever of course mm -hmm. the system will know that that is the last version she has seen the previous version that you produced and have updated the, the, the unique really copy so the flow of events is linear mm -hmm. there is no problem the problem is when you download something, you keep it there, you don't do anything, you go to the pub, you drink a beer, whatever, and keep a copy there for you. She downloads another copy and works hard on it, and blah, blah, and works and makes a hundred of changes. Then put the file back on the server. You come back to the pub, from the pub, drunk, don't download the latest version, work on the version that you already had, make a little more, little small change, upload it back you were working on something that was not synchronized to the latest changes that she had that's where conflicts might arise yeah right okay makes sense so it's about the timing of the synchronization events not necessarily of your changes or yeah. your downloading it's about it's the synchronization events it's yeah because i mean with the central process uh, for instance Rebecca, because we i mean i'm, I'm right, taking yeah. instance from work you know, the professional but it, okay, but we we use data work assets and we work on the same model in synchronicity with one another. But that's I don't perceive that as real time modeling because you still got to stay back and then be synchronized and stuff like that. Yeah, it's not it's not real time. Right. right. Yes. I was just classifying. But yeah, yeah. <coughs> right. See, it's about the way in which the changes are broadcasted to other people. That that different. Okay, so there is a hell of a lot of theory <coughs> when it comes to sorting this out. Now, people have thought of all models, but there are technical limitations in, in all approaches. But before anything else, there are kind of behavioral limitations that need to be addressed. Because you want to be sure that your it's your model, you own it. Also, sometimes people don't think that BIM models are interesting or important. They consider BIM models only as a mean to produce a drawing. So all the procedural, formal uh, processes of validating and uh, checking for, for uh, building design happens on 2D printed out on paper copies of your model. You will find this very common. Well, traditionally. Then people are quickly realizing that they are you know, losing on potential, lots of potential benefits, but they are doing this traditionally because they want to protect the, uh, the company they work from, from, again, uh, technical mm, glitches, in the operations of a software that don't really realize their way. <coughs> so, uh, one of the research students that we have here at the university is looking into defining the protocols that will allow us to behave on BIM models just as we would for software development models so that everybody can have their local copies, they can work freely and the intelligence in this BIM server will be capable of merging seamlessly all changes 
uh, that uh, all well all the change sets that it recognizes until there is a theoretical clash. If it does recognize that there is a theoretical clash, it will highlight the clash to the designer that put in the last changes and say, well, these are the multiple options that I can see for this building. There could be an oval table or a square table. And asks the user to you know, uh, select what is the right uh, the right information. So it asks to a superior authority, the user, the designer, uh, to resolve a conflict that it cannot resolve automatically. Okay? Uh, this chart here comes from uh, um, from um, a software application that is called GIT uh, that is uh, um, a source control software that you can use for developing software application in, in a shared environment. And I'm mentioning it because these are um, some of the functions that you can do. So you can create a repository, browse it, change something, revert <coughs> some changes. Maybe you can start trying things. You can say, okay, what if the building was not in this form? So not necessarily all the changes that you make are changes that you want to retain. Okay? You might be, as a designer, experimenting on some solutions for some time. Maybe you can spend a couple of days trying to add another layer, another story to a building and see what will be the repercussions on it, on costs, time, and so on and so forth. And you are half the way through Okay, you've started doing a lot of work, and people call you in and say, "Wait a second, what is? The, how many? How many?" They ask you a question about the building, and you don't want to give them the answer of extracting that data from this attempt that you're running. You will want to revert temporarily to the latest official version of the drawing, run the query, get the data, send it out, and then go back to the latest point where you we're still playing with your ideas and so on and so forth so you would want to maybe branch your drawing open a different possible path so um, experiment for it for a while and then either keep it or drop it okay the interesting bit is that sometimes you can think of the same principles for multiple changes so you could actually have your baseline of the drawing, so your latest reliable version of the drawing. You branch it out to create uh, one more stories, and you do something about that. And then somebody calls in and says, look, there is a problem at the entrance, I need a larger door. And you go back to the original branch and create a new branch, trial to add the larger door you call it and then you start working on it and uh, you might be happy with that or not happy with that but it's a different branch it's like a parallel universe to the new story that you're, you're adding okay at some point people might tell you okay we have the money to add the new story and we it, it matches regulations so we can go ahead with that and somebody else will tell you, okay, the clients have seen it and they are happy with a larger door at the entrance. So, since we, these were two bifurcations from the original drawing, you don't have any place in your universe where they both coexist. So you want the system to be able to... Um, well, branch, but also merge. That should be somewhere... Yeah, merge. Merge, yeah. So you want to be able to kind of bifurcate and then pull that change set back and the other change set back. So all of a sudden you have both um, innovations into your drawing and everybody else can say, okay, brilliant, we now have a solution with a mo one more story and a broader door. Okay? These, uh, this is technology that we are currently working on. So 
in your bending execution plans, it's unlikely that you'll be able to say, we don't have any problems, we have this brilliant technology that solves it for us, but this is temporary. So, on one hand, we have to give you the technical ability to go out and define a building execu beam execution plan that is workable today, but on the other hand, you have to keep an eye open on updates and technological changes that are uh, uh, being developed or are being developed uh, right now because in five years' time, things will change. So you have to keep an eye open on this. <coughs> now, other aspects of support in, uh, uh, in working collaboratively, very likely online, very likely through IT systems, is the problem that people sometimes feel that if they haven't personal connection and personal relationships with the other people, they feel that it doesn't work. So it's sometimes good for virtual when you're defining virtual environments to have some level of social inclusion of the people that are working with you. Um, this is a fairly self-explanatory slide, but you know you could actually say, okay, every now and then, even if it's apparently not needed because we have a brilliant IT system that takes care of all of that for us, we have teleconferencing and we have all sorts of technologies, we want to have some face-to-face -face interactions. If, our, if we see that efficiency doesn't work because people don't bond, because they don't come to that level of understanding of each other so that they are working well together. Um, so sometimes even setting out some uh, so-called rules of netiquette. Have you ever heard of this term, netiquette? So it's netiquette. netiquette. Etiquette is the traditional French word for being polite and being elegant and doing the right thing at the right moment, right? Netiquette is the same thing applied to virtual behaviors. So when you go online on a chat, you don't use capital letters because people perceive that to be screaming. You, you, you knew that? Mm -hmm. Yes? So capital letters are shouting, okay? Uh, and sometimes people get really offended by that. You have unwillingly the caps lock on, yeah. Yeah. people get offense. They do. They honestly do. So, and I'm not, I'm not uh, kind of mm, trying to make a joke about this. They, they have, I mean, we are people, we have feelings, we have habits. So, an etiquette is not just about this petty th stuff. It's also about the things that you are advised to do before you post a request. Okay, you don't want people to be nagging around and in the forum that you set up to exchange information. They go and ask questions to everybody. So, where do I get the file? Where do I get the other file? You set up an etiquette that says, when you have such a question, first you go to our, our frequently, frequently asked questions session, section, you see if somebody has already answered that query, then, and only then, you go and ask the question in the open forum, if you can't find the answer, okay? Uh, so, these are important in when you have significantly, si significant proportions of the communication happening virtually. Uh, and of course, you need uh, to include training, uh, uh, training uh, sessions and training evaluation sessions. Uh, it, it was quite well covered yesterday during the session. I guess, yeah. Visual identification. Uh, that's subjective, but some people would like to know what's the face of the people that they have contacts with very often. And, uh, you know, I've just been working on a project and I honestly have no clue of the faces of the people that I've met, I've worked on, I've worked with for six months. Most of them, I have no clue whatsoever. I've called them, I've sent emails, I've sent fax, I've sent materials through, uh, through um, express couriers. If I bump on them on the street, they mean nothing to me. I have never seen them. So, 
I can work in that environment. Somebody else might have troubles working in that environment. These might be things that you want to consider. Um, and cer certainly, you have to include some level of participation into the negotiation processes for people. Particularly in virtual environments, if you just drop institutionally workloads and work frames and workflows on top of people without them having any say into whether they think it's efficient, not efficient, difficult, if there are better ways of doing that, that will come back to bite you very soon. So these are all things that you should consider in the definition and in the progression to the definition of your BIM execution plan. And uh, again, there are a number of advices here. Uh, the last uh, that I think is probably important uh, is the creation of an online community that tends to be go beyond the basic, uh, the basic uh, needs for the project to see maybe if uh, coordination can or collaboration, whatever. I, I always bump the terms. You know that already. Uh, can be established for future longer benefits. There is a, a little uh, thing I wanted to say about the concept of integration. Uh, the, the, the key word integration is often used uh, in, in a number of different scenarios and frequently misunderstood. For me, integration is what you read there. The keyword being with no human intervention. So you want to produce an environment, and well, if you are aiming at integration, you want to produce an environment whereby automated flows of information are really automated. They don't need you to go down and do something, pull a lever, press a button make a phone call. No. The information, if it is integrated, it will be there for you on demand when you need. It will be already in the right place. Already in your system. You won't have to go and pull it from another system. Make sense? So, two systems might be, uh, might be uh, bridged. Okay, there might be bridges for that. So it might be that if you want to see whether there is a new update, you have to go online, download the latest packages, and uh, uh, do some sort of technical s uh, activity, and then you can see whether the information has been changed. If you have reached the level of integration, you can just go there and see if there are any changes. You don't have any activity in between. You go directly to put information out of your system. Yeah, ten minutes. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> we have talked yesterday about the idea of four D um, sequencing, so the activity of planning in three in three D four. And I had uh, an idea to ask you to uh, have a little exercise about that. How many of you have done this before? Okay. What have you done? You mean uh, timing, timing the Time. 3D model? Yes, but ideally connecting a 3D model with the Gantt plan or something like that, which is the most sophisticated version. I have to do it separate, never coordinate. Okay. I have to do the Gantt plan for one side and the second. So you never reached the point where you could see something like this on screen? No. Okay. So this is possible. You can have a 3D model have a plan and say well this activity correlates to that element and you can see how slide moving a slider across you see uh, this day this is the situation and so on um, I want so we'll probably run it tomorrow at some point this seminar I'll give you a task and you'll have to think of what is the 
beam execution planning needs that uh, requirements that are needed for achieving this level of interoperation okay uh, we'll do it tomorrow uh, we did a short form of that in the, the um, uh, yeah, uh, yes that's why uh, VR in the undergraduate AT and yeah. was a did part of it but not not practically. But, you know, I'm not asking you to do it practically here. I'm trying to make you create a BIM execution plan that would allow that. Okay? And that will require you to add codes that are shared, uh, specify modeling in a particular way, and so on. So we'll try that as a seminar exercise tomorrow. Now, the, la the last slides of these uh, we will go through extremely quickly because they are just pointers to resources that I want you to, to read. So I'll put all of these resources online. And this is the list of templates that uh, you could start from to produce your BIM execution plan. So we start from MPS, Penn State University, the version, the, the British version of uh, AEC UK and some British standards. Uh, we have already seen the idea of level of detail that is also something that is uh, of support and that's also one thing that I would point you to. Uh, Penn State University produces a guide that you can download from this URL here. How many of you have read this already? You have? I think I've come across, I'm not too sure. I, I download and I skim. I don't really. So you have it on your disk? Yeah, yeah. That's good. Next yeah. step, of course, is reading it. Uh, but just, you know, the fact that you have it could say something about you. you are, you're either very good or lazy. <laughs> there is this syndrome of, you know, the, the file folder syndrome whereby you put something on a disk and you, you feel you know everything there is to know about that because you have it on the disk anyway. Yes! Yeah. I can go and read it whenever I want. But you never go and read it. And that's not really good. Uh, but, well, it supports you in the identification of value of BIM execution planning and it gives you a template that you can start from to say, okay, this is what they suggest people would do and then you see how that would cater for the need of your specific uh, case. Another one is the AEC UK BIM protocol, again freely available online from this URL. Uh, it's similar in some aspects, different in some aspects. You, the benefit of this is that you can go and pick and mix and you say, well I'll use this part of that because it works best in my environment the level of detail I will get from another source and so on. So we are still at the stage where we try to make the most of the situation where we, that we find, trying to optimize the learning from different sources. British Standard also uh, have uh, produced um, some information on uh, ways to set out a methodology and format for the provision and integrated reference for the process and data required by a BIM. Blah, blah, blah. What does it mean? The usual thing. How do you write a BIM execution plan? So they have guidance for that. Um, and that's it. So we didn't manage to have the, the seminar today. We'll try to find some time tomorrow to go about it. But uh, yeah, the next big thing that you must do is go and read those papers that I was referring to. Because that's where the bulk of it is now for you. Okay? Fine. We'll uh, call our guests in.